Okay, folks, time to talk about the case of two Daniels, two very similar Daniels uh, in name, one named Daniel Perry, who was just convicted in Texas and sentenced to 25 years for the murder of a BLM protester who was holding an assault rifle. And then you've got the case of Daniel Penny, a New Yorker who and former Marine, who has been charged with manslaughter in the case of uh, chokehold restraining a mentally ill man, Jordan Neely, on the New York subways. And I'm looking at both of these cases, and what interests me about them is how conservatives, or people who are on the conservative side, are rallying to the side of both of these men. You've got, in the case of Daniel Perry, the Texan, Governor Greg Abbott of Texas has uh, demanded that the parole board, cons or not por parole board, uh, board of pardons, uh, consider sending a pardon recommendation his way. And then you've got people like Scott Adams and uh, uh, Mike Cernovich defending Daniel Penny up in New York and even recommending that people donate to his legal defense fund. Now, I've looked a little bit into both of these cases, and here's the thing. I don't see anything in them that make me especially feel like I need to jump out and uh, protest how these men have been treated by the legal system. Because in the case of Daniel Perry, what seems to have happened is that he had to, on a daily basis, drive through, in order to get to work, a crowd of BLM protesters, and, that, and doing so was making him more and more scared over time. <clears throat> now, he himself had a gun, and when he saw a man with an assault rifle walking toward him, but not necessarily pointing the gun his way, he took that to be enough of a threat to lethally shoot the guy. Now, I don't know about you, but... I remember all the videos I posted regarding Kyle Rittenhouse, and one of the things that I said in at least one of those videos was that if you, if you see a guy with a gun in an open carry state, just that person's openly carrying a gun can't be enough to trigger your right to self-defense. You have to be under some sort of actual threat from that person. And so there are people who were saying that Kyle Rittenhouse was a threat just by carrying around a gun, but that can't be the case because if you had an open carry state, which, um, God, it's been so long that I can't remember what state that that uh, took place in, uh, but I know it was open carry and he was legally allowed to carry that weapon, according to the judge, so there was no right of anyone to invoke self-defense against him merely for carrying a gun, and I would think that's the case here in Texas as well. Even if you had a bunch of people blocking your car, and even if one of them was holding an assault rifle, just the fact that he's holding an assault rifle means nothing unless that person is pointing the assault rifle at you. And according to multiple witness statements in the case of Daniel Perry, it was not the case that the person who died uh, was pointing the gun at Daniel Perry. So I don't see where all of the conservative outreach in the case of Daniel Perry is coming from unless they're just basically, it's just basically tired of seeing BLM protesters gumming up the streets. But, you know, you got to work within the confines of the First Amendment. The government can't shut down legitimate and peaceful protests so long as they are peaceful. And I don't know if you want to clarify something that actually blocks traffic and, and hinders people as, as something that's peaceful, but I think traditionally that is what we have done in this country. And so if Daniel Perry wandered into the middle of a peaceful protest and encountered a guy who was holding a gun and shot him because he was holding a gun, I don't see the defense for that, and so I don't know why you've got Greg Abbott rushing to pardon him, and I don't know why you've got a lot of conservatives rushing to this guy's defense. Similarly, in the case of Daniel Penny up in New York, what we have is the case of a mentally ill man, Jordan Neely, who got on the subway car and started shouting at people, saying that you know he was tired, he doesn't care if he goes back to prison, he's hungry, he wants money, etc., etc. But apparently, 
he didn't actually ever attack someone, which is what he would have had to do in order to warrant the kind of restraint that Daniel Penny put on him. And apparently Daniel Penny put him in a chokehold that was so severe and so long, uh, of such a long duration that guy died. And you would think that in, in the post-George Floyd age, how stupid do you have to be to be a white guy choking out a black man? All right? That just seems like you're lining yourself up to be on the cover of a news magazine. That just seems like you're lining yourself up to be the next uh, call, uh, the next officer chauvin. I'm surprised somebody didn't top, tap him on the shoulder and joke with him. <laughs> Look, officer chauvin, I think you better let the guy go. Now I don't know exactly how long he was, the, you know, Jordan Neely was held in the in the chokehold. Maybe he thought that three minutes or however long it was wasn't enough for the guy to die. But that's not really the point. The point is, is that if you've got a person who is behaving aggressively on the subway, well, that's a bad thing, and that that can feel threatening and it can feel scary. But until that guy actually robs someone or actually uh, hits someone or actually steals something of theirs, you know, takes a hat off their head or what have you, you don't actually have grounds to put that person in a life-threatening chokehold. And that's what Daniel Penny did. And to hear people saying, well, this guy is just a flat-out hero. I mean, imagine, <laughs> I mean, this is the worst case scenario, but imagine that a white guy sees a black guy behaving aggressively on the subway and decides to restrain the guy by putting a damn noose around his neck and hoisting him from the ceiling and then saying, you know, look, I'm a hero. I stopped the guy from behaving aggressively. It's like, yeah, but you lynched the guy. I mean, that is, I mean, with his arm serving as the noose, that's technically what happened here, at least as far as I know. Now, of course, everything's innocent until proven guilty, and I don't want anybody to think that I, I know all the facts and I know everything that happened, and, you know, I, I have any uh, sage visibility into the evidence or law in this case. But I just want to say, before you stumble all over yourselves, uh, especially opening your wallets to uh, to help either of these men, you might want to look into their cases a little more strongly and not just go with the tide of public sentiment that is carrying off even, even some pundits who I thought had better reasoning skills at their hands. So, I'm Mike Partika. Uh, I don't know if this has been of any help, but I'm just saying, hold off. Hold off on judgment. Uh, in whichever direction. I mean, let the jury figure this out and let the law uh, have its course. I mean, that that to me has always been the safest way to go. Uh, we saw it work correctly in the case of Kyle Rittenhouse, and, you know, let's have some faith in it that it has worked correctly in the case here in Texas and that it's going to work correctly in the case of New York. I'm Mike Partika. Thank you very much for watching. Please uh, follow me on Gab. Uh, feel free to post this video to Twitter where I cannot. And... Um, uh, do subscribe so you can get notified of future videos, and I will talk to you later.